welcome also um, from me, from my side, everybody. Um, so um, this uh, talk is split into two parts, as you surely saw uh, in the agenda. So it's basically one talk. Um, this is the outline. This is the outline. So uh, we start with um, TVB on eBrain's workflows, uh, including um, some words on cloud privacy, or rather it's a central topic, actually. Um, as Petra said, and uh, the second part is um, about an extension proposal for computational models, um, a bits extension proposal uh, for extending bits towards computational models. So let's start uh, with the workflows. Um, um, I'm sure most of you um, know this site, uh, ebrains.eu. This is the uh, landing page where you arrive. Um, when you enter this URL, uh, eBrains uh, is a cloud uh, service uh, for, for brain research or a cloud platform, a cloud infrastructure. It offers many different uh, kinds of services. And today we talk mostly about these simulation services. eBrains offers uh, many different simulation services, like, for example, Nest or Elephant. Um, and here we focus on the, the virtual brain simulation services. Uh, which are um, about large-scale uh, brain network simulation um, in contrast to, for example, Nest, which is more about uh, spiking network simulation. No? So this is at a smaller scale, but the virtual brain is at a large scale of um, full brain networks. And these are the six main um, categories of services of TVB on eBrains. Um, we have the main the virtual brain, the web GUI, um, the graphical user interface, which is served as a website over the web and which you can use them um, as a cloud service. Um, we have TVB multi-scale co-simulation where you can in parallel simulate the virtual brain and nest um, to simulate brain activity on multiple scales at the same time. Uh, since these simulations are computationally very expensive, we also have TVB for HPC. These are high performance codes um, optimized for supercomputers, um, where you um, have, for example, automatic code generation or um, parallelized codes uh, to run on many CPUs in parallel or GPUs. Uh, we have TBB inverse, a virtual epileptic patient. This simulates um, patient brain activity and um, has parameter fitting routines. We have the TBB image processing pipeline. Um, so this pipeline generates all the data you need for um, brain simulation for personalized brain simulation. So you enter MRI data as input and as output, you get the typical data you need to run TVB style simulations, which are structural connectomes, for example, functional connectomes, FMI time series, and so on. And this falls on the category of TVB ready data, uh, which we will also um, introduce here. Um, the TVB on eBrains cloud infrastructure um, has many components um, and they are interacting in several ways. Uh, so this is a high level view, which tries to convey um, the basic setup and um, uh, there are many arrows. So let's try to get step-by-step step through it. So um, we start with personal data. Um, brain modeling requires personal data that is subject to uh, general data protection regulation. Um, so, um, uh, when, when we do brain research, we want to, this is precisely the information we need for brain research. So the medical state of um, a person um, uh, is precisely the information we need. So we cannot um, simply pseudonymize um, personal data. We cannot um, simply uh, uh, reduce all the information that characterizes the medical state of a person um, in order which is possible for some data sets or for some questions or problems, but not in our case. So in our case, um, there is always the danger that the data, even if no like directly identifying information like names or uh, birth dates and so on um, is, is in there, even then um, it was shown that um, you can reconstruct the identity of uh, the data subject uh, with relatively simple tools actually. Um, so, for example, even just one slice of a functional connectome. So if you have a functional connectivity matrix, um, uh, a brain network, 
representation, even just a tiny slice of such a brain network, the information about a subject's brain network was shown to be enough to reconstruct the identity of the subject. And of course, this can lead to uh, bad outcomes, uh, to, 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 to very bad things um, when um, medical information of uh, people uh, leak into the public space. Uh, so we need to um, we need to ensure data privacy, and here we um, use three technologies mainly. We use end-to-end -end encryption, sandboxing, and access control. Um, so for access control, we have um, uh, an identity and access management system. So uh, we know the identities of users, and um, we can authenticate them, and we can uh, convey specific authorization decisions towards them. So we can authorize them to have different levels of, um, of rights and permissions. Um, so eBrains provides, so this we do now, we, we secure the data and now we are inside the cloud, inside a secure cloud or a cloud that uh, tries to secure the data. And there is never 100% security. There are always loopholes um, in shared infrastructure. So this is something we need to be aware of. Um, supercomputers um, and the internet are shared infrastructures. We use these together with other people, and it's always possible that isolation fails and that we somehow enter the space of someone else. Um, so eBrains provides several core services from which other services derive. Um, let's uh, give a quick overview over these core services. We have the wiki, um, which, um, as the name already suggests, um, lets you uh, create wiki pages. And it's also uh, a container for uh, collabs, um, which are themselves containers for collaborative research projects. So uh, you can imagine a wiki as um, a set of rich text files um, uh, specified in marker, markdown language. Um, uh, where you can have, where you can search, for example, you can search through these files. Um, you can have a tree-like structure to organize uh, the information and knowledge. Uh, you can have certain a certain form of access control. Um, you have certain programmatic interfaces, and you have um, many tools for uh, collaborative work. Um, Drive is a file system in the cloud um, for each eBrains user. Um, where the user can, um, in a relatively fine-grained manner, specify uh, who uh, can access uh, different files. So there's a rights management. The user can um, define groups um, and units um, of people and um, or, or, or user accounts and um, assign those different rights. And so we have here a file system in the cloud where you can upload data, store data, and download data and also move data in, uh, to other positions. Um, lab is a JupyterLab instance, a, a JupyterLab server, um, and each client, uh, user basically gets their own um, client here, a sandbox client, their own JupyterLab space, uh, where they can run, execute live code and develop code. They can do it. Um, uh, 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 together with others by sharing um, um, secure links, basically, uh, to the data files, or they can also work in isolation in, in um, this instance. And there, this, this Jupyter Lab interface, in the end, uh, allows a very flexible and a lot of operations, basically. So you have a full programmatic interface to the cloud, basically, uh, one could say. So here you can. Um, uh, create services, uh, connect services, and use services, basically. Um, office, uh, so now you uh, have a collaborative research project, you did all the research, produce results, and now you can even write the paper together or uh, collect the results in um, uh, uh, this word processor here or in Excel tables and so on. So there's collaborative uh, work on documents. Um, here we have OpenShift as a core service. This is um, the whole management of the cloud, basically. Not the whole, but um, important parts of cloud management, basically. So here um, we have a lot of logging, for example. We um, orchestrate containers 
um, we balance our resources and can move resources, we can monitor the usage, uh, we can implement certain security features. Um, this does open shift. And in the back end, uh, we have um, supercomputers, HPC. Uh, Phoenix is a network of five large European supercomputing centers. And um, the goal here is to present um, these uh, or make available these resources under a common interface. Um, uh, which yeah, is obviously the, the idea of a cloud where you have flexible balancing of uh, loads and resources. And um, yeah, so here any brains user can access these backend resources via their um, their eBrains cloud front end, basically, without needing to know too much details about uh, the backend resources, which is uh, one goal. So um, to connect these services, um, a RESTful API is used, and um, this is implemented with PyUnicore. A Unicore and, and the Python wrapper PyUnicore. Um, so a RESTful API, we use um, HTTP methods like get, post, put, delete. Um, a, a client puts uh, a HTTP um, request uh, somewhere on a server, and back with the payload, we get a JSON. Um, structure um, and with this we can exchange information between the client and the server. We also have uh, um, additional ways to um, to manage uh, authentication uh, flows and 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 to convey access rights. So here we have a, a two-factor or two-way or back-channel authentication. We have um, our our portal here where we authenticate uh, authenticate with an identity server. The server identifies us, gives us our token. This is our identity. Now we can access with this token the REST API of Unicore. And Unicore itself will then validate the, do the token uh, via a second channel, um, which in increases the security here. And then uh, we are in Unicore, and with Unicore, we can access all these um, nice supercomputing resources, computing power, and storage resources. And how does this look like? Um, uh, 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 programmatically or, or uh, under the hood. So it's really simple. PyUnicore, you can directly import it um, as, a, as a Python package here in your JupyterLab environment. Um, eBrains puts your, so after you authenticate it with eBrains, Keycloak will generate a bureau token for you, which will keep you locked in. And um, eBrains then puts this token, token readily available for you into your Jupyter Lab environment. You can simply grab it from here and uh, connect basically to a supercomputer where you have um, supercomputing resources. Um, your accounts must be mapped within eBrains Keycloak and um, with this, this um, Phoenix uh, supercomputer. Then uh, we, we connect, we authenticate ourselves. And um, here, for example, we can see our jobs. We have the many, Unicore gives us many wrapper functions or high level functions to operate a supercomputer uh, from a programmatic uh, uh, Python interface. So um, we have, on the one hand, we have these wrappers like uh, remove dear, make dear, and so on. We can upload, download files, and so on. Um, but we can also like, operate very similar, like if we would uh, 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 create us a shell on the supercomputer, we can just execute bash commands here, for example. So we can either use uh, directly operate a supercomputer like we know it basically uh, from the past, and um, there is also high level wrappers that um, uh, make the programmatic um, pipelining of these uh, resources a bit easier. Um, and these TBB services then, um, so now we have, uh, how are they connected? They are connected via RESTful API. And how are they deployed now? Um, so we have different deployments, different um, uh, ways these uh, uh, resources are represented and delivered. Um, uh, this we can see here. Um, and now I would suggest that we just um, go step by step. Um, so this was a lot, so we're, go step by step through these different deployments uh, for the different services um, to get a more intuitive picture. Um, so now it's with less errors and now we can see it nicer. Um, the virtual brain has a web GUI, which we will um, uh, show in a minute. 
it also exists as a container image. Um, you can uh, just pull a container either on a supercomputer or locally and um, have the full environment. Um, well, this was a, a new development. So in the, in the past, TBB was mainly available either as standalone versions, already compiled versions for Windows, Mac, or Linux, or as a Python library um, that you um, uh, uh, could uh, import into your Python code. Um, and now we also have this container here. And we have um, also um, a web GUI. So this, this GUI that you previously run locally on your computer, you have say, it now served over the internet with backend resources. So this GUI has um, supercomputing resources in the backend where resource intensive, intensive uh, computations can be performed. And um, we also serve the, um, the Jupyter uh, notebooks or the, the Jupyter Lab client um, under a dedicated URL um, where you can persist projects and um, uh, access the interface directly. So um, let's try out the web GUI. Um, for um, trying out the web, web GUI, we use uh, TVB ready data, which can be readily obtained from uh, uh, knowledge graph. So um, let's try this out now. I go on this uh, knowledge graph website and I look for two more. And here I have the two more data set. And now if I click this button, download data set, um, something like two gigabytes will be downloaded. This is the data set. I won't do this now to to not block the bandwidth and um, instead um, already show you the downloaded data set. Um, so this is the data set tree. Um, we have a, a data set uh, data descriptor. Um, this is added to the data set during creation um, with the eBrains creation team and it uh, describes the data. And then um, this is the structure is bits format, derivatives. We will go into the details of the bits format uh, later today. Um, so uh, we will just look into the most important files here. So we have one uh, file participants. Um, here we have metadata on the participants, like their sex, their age, um, their tumor type, and so on. Um, here we have uh, a description of the brain atlas, the parcellation. This is a uh, free surface, this is Ken Kiliani uh, that was used here. Uh, we have functional connectivity matrices. Um, and the other most important part of this data set um, is for each subject structure connectomes. And um, what, what is inside the structure connectome dot zip? Um, this is a TVB format. So this SC dot zip is a TVB readable format. It needs uh, to have these files with these names, or at least these um, name parts. And the most important file here is actually just weights um, dot text. We don't use tracked lines here. And these are the connection strengths, the connection weights. And these are um, in these sc.zip. So let's try it out. Um, what you see here is already the result of uh, what I would like you to show now. Um, but since computing these results takes some time, just download this result for you and uh, know this is how it will look like in the end. Um, but now we'll start over from the beginning. And um, we start at project. Um, let's have an overview of all projects. Um, you will always have this default project usually. And um, here I already made some test runs. Um, let's try a new project. We create a new project. Test something. Test. Save. OK. Now this is our active project. Let's look into the project. It's um, fresh, so there's nothing in it. Um, OK, now uh, let's try to upload the structural connect home. Um, here we have different um, opportunities to upload data into TBB, and we use this connectivity uh, zip. Let me choose the file. OK, I'll give it another name. I don't know if it's important, but always do this, and then upload. And so. This may take a little bit time now. Hopefully it works. So there is some, um, uh, ah, yeah, great. 
that is great. Okay, so now we have the connectivity there. We can have a look at it. We could also visualize it. We could analyze it and do um, do some operations with it. Um, but what we want to do now is we want to simulate uh, with this connectivity. So now we just head over to the simulator cockpit. Here we already have the connectivity. There's nothing else in this project, so there's only this connectivity. Um, we uh, have no uh, uh, conduction velocity, so this parameter is um, not applied in this moment here. We have the uh, connection strength and an offset. We don't use a cortical surface for the simulation. We don't use a stimulus as a local model. Um, yeah, let's use reduced Wang Wang with excitatory and inhibitory populations. We have the parameters. We use the default parameters. Um, we add some noise. We use stochastic coin. Um, integration step size. I use this default value. I guess this is uh, a multiple of two or something. Um, here we have some noise. Here we have temporal average as our output monitor. This is what we're looking at. So we average the raw time series a little bit, downsample a little bit. Um, which variables we look at. This is the excitatory and inhibitory um, synaptic activity. And here we just, yeah, for test purposes, but, um, so it won't be done um, in, in, in one minute, so it will take longer. Um, but uh, I here select one second uh, to, to simulate, and then I set up a parameter space exploration. This is typically something that won't run on the front end because now um, several instances of TVB will be um, simulated um, either in parallel or one after the other. And um, in order to compute the results for these different parameters. So here we select, for example, the coupling strengths. And, and um, so in the picture you saw, I think I, I worried the, um, yeah, maybe, yeah, this is a um, recurrent excitation. It doesn't matter. So we select the parameter, we select next, and then we launch the parameter space exploration. Um, okay, now, ooh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> so this will probably now kill the server. I've just launched uh, 20,000 operations. Sorry, Paula. <laughs> uh, this is actually, I should have uh, now um, uh, downsampled this a bit. So I used quite a fine grained steps as were the default values. I'm sorry, so I know the computer has a lot to do um, and will definitely not be done during this talk. But anyway, you can give yourself an update um, of uh, how, uh, yeah, okay, I was a bit too um, uh, uh, too quick here, but here you can see um, there are some update about the current processing. Here we have um, 50 seconds. I don't know, I should probably cancel the simulation. Um, oops. Yeah, okay, but um, this is basically it. Um, we started, we downloaded data, uploaded it in TVB and started the simulation. And the result you already saw previously. Okay, so um, alternatively, uh, we don't need to use this web GUI. We can just pull the container into uh, our resources and use them there, or we install um, here with a package manager, just a library, and um, TV has a nice programmatic interface uh, with these classes where you can set up your simulation and um, uh, run it. And you can use this in, so you can create as many collabs on eBrains as you want and um, run these simulations there. Um, now the TVB image processing pipeline. So our next uh, cloud service. And there we will also talk uh, about security. Um, the um, TVB image processing pipeline are three um, containers that are executed one after the other. Um, as input data, we have uh, MRI data. So here we have this input structure, MRI like T1 weighted MRI and diffusion weighted MRI. And um, this container uses MRTRIX3 to perform diffusion weighted MRI tractography and full brain, generate full brain tractograms and all the required preprocessing. Or average processing. And yeah, we use this here to preprocess. Uh, the fMRI data and um, uh, yeah, clean the fMRI mostly. And um, the last one is here, a uh, TVB pipeline converter, uh, which manages the overall flow of the pipeline and also implements the security features. And in the end, um, you know, this is 
um, not, not uh, unfortunately not shown here, and in the end also produces the um, the correct homes and a TVB ready input date. So at a more um, uh, under the hood level, what is happening here? Um, we upload encrypted MRI data to Drive, to eBrain's, eBrain's Drive. Then uh, we use our uh, Jupyter uh, client to forward it to the supercomputer and also to configure our, um, our, our job on the supercomputer. Um, a lot of things are handled by the, the pipelines or the, the user doesn't need to write job scripts, um, but um, uh, one can configure uh, flags and parameters of the processing. Then the three containers are run one after the other on the supercomputer, and afterwards the encrypted results are ready for download again. And um, again, one level uh, deeper, how does this um, actually look like? So here we um, upload, we click the button upload in eBrains Drive, um, upload our encrypted data to the, um, to the eBrains Drive. Then we can forward it to the supercomputer. We saw these unicore commands already. Here we can specify some parameters. Um, and uh, here we uh, define a, a job script. So you don't, in, in, this is still kind of necessary, but uh, the next version, um, this job script uh, will be automatized. And then um, afterwards, after we're done, we can again download our results from the eBrains cloud. Um, and now um, uh, here comes uh, one of the, the main problems we address here. Uh, and this is that, as we mentioned already, rich personal data like MRI or connect homes require sorrow protection. So uh, it's really not enough um, to, for example, deface an MRI. So um, it, there was some experimental deep learning algorithm which was able to reconstruct faces from deep faced, uh, defaced MRI. Um, and um, yeah, so as I mentioned, a, a tiny slice of such a functional connect home was already enough to reconstruct the identity. And um, so, uh, God knows what technologies will be available in the future. So um, what kinds of personal and private information you could read out from a tractogram, from a network diagram, from, I mean, we also have here very explicit anatomical reconstructions so um, these data require soil protection. And this is a high level interview, uh, overview, a really high level overview um, over what can happen basically. So we are sending data over shared networks, internet. Um, this data goes over computers where um, people could uh, uh, listen and intercept the data. Um, usually there are, um, encryption protocols, so these data packages are encrypted, but um, like uh, immediately before this encryption, immediately after the um, decryption, they are unencrypted. And um, yeah, also uh, if someone, yeah, if, if the encryption fails, then you have basically data packets that could be intercepted. Then breaking on devices is, is basically every, uh, yeah, this captures most, uh, um, things that could happen basically. So either during a device that is currently working live on the data, um, these are shared environments. It, there could be an isolation failure. A hacker could gain access uh, to the memory spaces um, or the disk spaces um, uh, where personal data is processed. And um, also for devices that are not in use, um, magnetic storage devices, for example, even if things were deleted, um, they can often be read out uh, even if they were overwritten. Um, and uh, user impersonation, this falls actually also under break-in, I would say, but this is just to remind you that if you lose your password, that then no protection can help you. So if someone gets access to your secrets, um, then um, no security infrastructure can protect you anymore. So, um, Encryption is one of the main um, tools used to secure the privacy of data. Um, yesterday, Angela Mer Merkel said, uh, uh, no one wants to, uh, so there are attempts at the moment to, um, 
to implement backdoors uh, uh, in, in WhatsApp, for example. And Angela Merkel yesterday said no one wants uh, that, uh, to, to, that anyone can read their personal data, even if this makes um, the job harder for um, security services. I found this an interesting statement, an impressive statement. Impressive statement. Um, anyway, um, what is the main point here is that uh, encryption is the central technology for ensuring data privacy. So without encryption, it will be, get really hard to ensure data privacy. Um, so we really need encryption and ideally end-to-end -end encryption without backdoors. Otherwise, the whole purpose of encryption is uh, put at absurdum. Um, so these two in light blue down there are basically um, the commands. Um, this is how it should be and how it should be implemented and is implemented in the software uh, in order um, to uh, in, in have a better protection, basically. So it's simple. Unencrypted personal data is never written out directly. So there is never a hard drive, a file system or anything where an unencrypted personal data file is stored. This is simply, this simply shouldn't be possible. Um, unencrypted personal data may only exist in the main memory of a protected process for the time of the processing. And I, so um, unencrypted personal data may only be used um, really, uh, it, it may only be exist really shortly before the processing and it must be immediately destroyed if it's not needed anymore. Um, and it um, may never be written to a, to a file system directly. So with directly, I mean, um, if this file system is shielded from the host and the host cannot look into this file system and also the file system cannot get access to the host, then it's okay because there's no way to access it. So these are the commandments basically for encryption. And um, uh, so yeah, let's, let's um, um, what, what implies this? So this implies that personal data is encrypted before it leaves the computer of the data controller or data processor. So data controller or processors in our terms um, of, the, of the GDPR. And these are the only, only entities who are legally allowed uh, to access and use this data. Also the data subject, but I guess the data subject will rarely handle um, the data. Um, the password for decryption is encrypted with a public key. Um, and the corresponding private key is generated at the final processing site shortly before the processing and never leaves the sandbox con control process. So uh, we use a technology that is called um, public key cryptography, um, which is yeah, the foundation of uh, basically a large part of our modern um, infrastructure, electronic infrastructure. And so this is really important. And the internet wouldn't work without it. And um, the concept is that you have uh, two keys to encrypt and decrypt your data. One is a public key and one is a private key. The public key can be freely shared um, with everyone. It doesn't matter if someone knows this key, it's not a secret. You can only use this key to encrypt the data, but you can never decrypt it unless you also have the private key. So what we are doing is we make sure that this private key is never written anywhere and only exists uh, very fleetingly somewhere in main memory of a processed, um, protected process. And um, yeah, intermediate processing results are only written inside sandbox file systems and securely deleted before termination. So there are methods to securely delete files such that they cannot be um, uh, uh, reconstructed. Um, and um, how do we do this? We use sandboxes. Um, so sandboxes are really um, like a, a child sandbox. Um, uh, the, the kid can fall over and it will land softly. And um, every iPhone uh, makes heavy use of sandboxes. So um, when you run an app on your iPhone, um, Apple makes sure that this app cannot um, yeah, make damage with your data and damage with your iPhone. So um, it, this is also like a, a very important technology. Um, without this, many things wouldn't be possible. And um, uh, so unencrypted personal data and secrets may only be written into a temporary mount file system namespace 
that is entirely invisible from the host and which is fully and securely cleaned up when the last process exits. And um, in, in this sandbox, we also want to unshare as much namespaces as possible. So we don't want uh, uh, that the host and our protected process can mutually see each other's process table, the inter-process communication table, and all their network sockets. Um, so these were a lot of nerd words now. Um, let's uh, uh, try to make it a bit more understandable. So this, this sounds a bit like magic. How is something like this possible? Um, the answer is uh, Linux. Uh, Linux is uh, yeah really cool that that um, they um, working on, on on such things and making these things available through a heavily involved community. Um, so a BRAP is a Linux program that makes use of user namespaces. We'll come to this con concept in a moment. But in the end, um, BRAP really allows you to create a new completely empty file system namespace where the root is on a temporary file system that is invis invisible from the host and which will be automatically cleaned up when the last process exits. exits. Um, so you have really basically you set up a container in your operating system and you say, I don't care about anything outside of this container. Inside this container, I'm a root, I'm everything I want to be. Um, and the, the, the parent process, BREP, will tightly um, control what will be visible inside and what will be visible outside. Um, so BREP creates a new mount namespace. Um, and even sets up new user IPC, PLT, and network and UTS namespaces. So what does this mean? User namespaces um, are a relatively new development that isolate security-related identifiers. So in Linux, everything is a file. Um, processes are a file. Processes communicate via files. And um, many things are organized in this tree-like structure, basically. And, um, these different capabilities or resources are given names that are defined by namespaces. And with this, you have basically a very fine-grained control about resources that are available to different clients of the system. And um, basically, how does this work? This BREP contain has internally a map that will, where you can explicitly map which part of the outside namespaces are available inside and which are not. And this is, um, was made possible by um, introducing user namespaces, which um, are a relatively new development from, from uh, Linux, where you can um, specify this clone new user flag. So there are, um, when a process is created in, a, um, in an operating system, you clone it, uh, you clone a parent process, basically all processes are in a tree-like structure. And um, this basically allows us to have subtrees that are completely isolated from um, the other trees. This is sandboxing, basically. So here we can see um, we can be anything we want inside our sandbox. And um, this um, uh, yeah, applies to, um, to inter-process communication, to the table of processes, to all the network ports that are open. Um, we can even give us an entire new host name. So, really cool hacking, hacking applications also become possible with things like that. And because um, the BREP developers were so kind to show this cute um, cat picture, I of course have to forward this to you. Okay, um, so now um, this is the overview basically, um, the idea, the concept, which is currently being implemented. Um, of the sandboxing and authentication and um, encryption solution for the pipeline. We have uh, three uh, entities here. We have the computer of the data controller, we have the eBrains cloud, and we have our backend supercomputers. And um, we start by authenticating ourselves. So um, we log in at eBrains, we enter our username and password, key cloak, um, recognizes us and um, gives us our token with which we can authenticate um, with a supercomputer. At this moment, uh, we could, for example, pull containers or do stuff on a supercomputer. Um, but when we really want to work then with private uh, 
private, private data, we have to start a sandbox. Now we only operate in a shielded subsystem that is invisible from the host. And inside this shielded subsystem, we create um, a public and private key pair, and we do the same on the um, data controller's computer. Why do we create two public uh, private key pairs? Um, one is necessary to upload the data. So um, we send our public key from the supercomputer to the, um, to the data controller such that um, the data controller can encrypt the data. And the data controller gives us their public key um, such that we can then later encrypt the results and give them back to the data controller. Okay, so now we have exchanged our public keys. We can now encrypt data for each other, um, but only um, the owner of the private key can decrypt it. So we uh, encrypt our public uh, our private data, um, we upload it to eBrains. Here it is now secured and um, enter it into, uh, so we copy it basically onto a login node or in some high performance storage file system or wherever on the supercomputer. And in the background, the sandbox will continue to exist. It is, this is basically um, a client server architecture. Though there is one part of the client on the eBrains um, uh, Jupyter Lab. Uh, uh, running and the uh, other uh, is here on the supercomputer and they um, communicate with each other and synchronize each other, make sure that um, they are on the same page basically. And after we um, again um, connect uh, front end and back end, um, we uh, decrypt the personal data directly into the sandbox, into a temporary file system that is invisible to the host. And we use only this temporary file system um, to store all our intermediate processing results. And now the pipeline processing begins, the containers fetch their data to and from uh, this temporary file system. And after they are done, they again encrypt the results and write out only encrypted results into a file system or over a network socket. And basically what gets back to the, um, to the data controller are only encrypted results, which the data controller can later decrypt with their private key. Um, this is the setup for, for um, the pipeline for um, TVB. Um, we also have a similar uh, setup um, with public private key infrastructure. Um, so here uh, we currently, so um, I should mention here, as you saw with this pipeline workflow, every time we have an ad hoc new pair of private and public keys. So if anything goes wrong here uh, at any point, um, the whole um, operation has to start from scratch. It has to start from creating this key pair, basically. So um, if there's any incident, any um, even just a slight hint of an incident, um, everything stops, everything is deleted, and um, the user uh, new keys have to be generated. So. Um, if there's an incident, one has to assume that secrets have leaked and that they are not usable anymore. Um, so here we are st uh, still at a general public key that can be um, uh, 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 taken from the TBB website and used to encrypt results. Internally, this is just a short step. Internally, TBB will again encrypt the data and um, only send um, internally encrypted data around with the, um, with the, with the front and back end um, uh, uh, clients. And um, in, in the end, it's a, it's a, a similar um, approach. Okay, um, this was pipeline and security. Um, so now I think we have, um, how long have we left? Mm, 12 minutes or so, I think. Correct. Yeah, 12 minutes. Okay, so I will continue with um, uh, with a few words about the remaining um, TVB uh, services that we have uh, on eBrains. The next one is uh, TVB multi-scale co-simulation. Um, so here, um, uh, the idea is that uh, we have a large-scale brain network model which simulates brain activity at a more um, abstract level. Um, and we have uh, spiking network simulators that uh, really simulate individual neurons. 
And um, here we want to, uh, to test, for example, what happens when um, a large-scale brain network model with plausible large-scale brain activity drives such a spiking network, for example, with plausible activity, basically. So we can, um, for example, simulate um, the majority of the brain um, at a large scale, and then we pick out some areas where we are particularly interested in smaller scale processes, and these we then um, model explicitly with uh, spiking networks, for example. And uh, one use case is, for example, um, we couple TVB to nest via proxy nodes, um, spike rate. So what a TVB neural mass model would typically do is it has a mean field uh, description of a population, like the mean firing rate of the population, for example. And this is an ongoing uh, dynamic process, um, how this firing rate um, fluctuates. And we could use this um, ongoing fluctuation of the firing rate as an um, input to uh, um, a spike generator, like a Poisson spike generator. So depending on the um, rate of spikes, we will draw many or few samples from a Poisson distribution in order um, to deliver spikes into spiking neurons. And by this, we can basically derive a spiking network with uh, large scale inputs. And how does this look like under the hood? Um, uh, Denise, um, has uh, implemented this um, and has made a nice interface where you can, in a structured manner, specify um, your different networks, your large scale network, your small scale network, the entities in this network, the coupling between these net networks, the types of receptors, the, the monitors, and so on, and um, the setup basically of this whole um, processing. Um, and um, to use TV multi-scale, um, we have um, several options. Uh, we, uh, it's a container also, we can pull the container and, um, locally or on a supercomputer and um, experiment uh, with the container. Uh, we have, again, um, Jupyter notebooks in our eBrains lab space. And um, TVBNest is a Python library where you can directly use it uh, with TDB together in your Python scripts. And, um, uh, it also has the HPC backend, basically. So we also have um, a direct URL, um, and, and also in your Jupyter uh, eBrains lab notebooks, um, you can um, directly connect uh, to the uh, HPC backend and push your jobs there. Um, yes, so I think I mentioned most of this. So we have this uh, direct URL where we have a, a direct web interface, but you also have your call-ups. Um, you have you can directly use your own collab credentials, and each user has its own sandbox instance. It uses the TVBS container image, and you can persistently store notebooks and um, push jobs to the supercomputer. Okay, and um, now we have TVB for HPC. Mm. TVB for uh, HPC are two components. Uh, we have um, uh, TVB HPC and fast TVB. Um, two different software packages. TVB HPC um, is um, based on RateML. Um, it's an XML-based meta language to specify models. So you can specify neural mass models um, using a, a key value uh, structure and automatically generate Python and uh, CUDA code from that, uh, which will then uh, run in parallel on, on graphic cards um, very efficiently. Um, how, how does this look like? So this is also a convenient interface. You just load your uh, uh, packages in Python, and then, um, as you can see here, uh, this, uh, this convenient um, language where you define your model entities. Like here, we define state variable. The name of the state variable is R. Um, the default value is uh, uh, this one, and we have boundary or, uh, boundaries between there and there of plausible values, and so on. And here we can then um, also specify equations. So here we have uh, a time derivative, um, the usual form of uh, specifying dynamical systems in this context, where um, we look how um, a, a short, a small or short um, element changes and uh, can here specify the mathematical expression with this ASCII notation. Um, 
So this is very convenient. Oh, we specify it once and then automatically generate uh, code for CUDA and for Python. And um, fast CVB is more like a specialized um, high performance implementation. It's uh, specialized uh, for CPUs. Um, so here you um, really uh, squeeze everything out of a CPU um, until the last uh, bit of performance, basically. So um, here I really try to um, employ the CPU at any time without um, cycles that are lost, basically. Um, um, we try to optimally have a, an optimal memory layout where there are not too many cache failures um, and um, this loading from memory to L1 caches, which takes a lot of time, um, is, is avoided as far as possible. It is parallelized for multi-threading, so you can spawn multiple threads to occupy multiple cores. And the memory format is sparse, so you can uh, simulate also extremely large Brandenburg models with millions or uh, yeah, an extremely large number of, of uh, nodes, even on a standard laptop, basically, in a uh, reasonable time. And it's containerized. Um, now, TVB inverse and the virtual epileptic patient. Um, so um, this started out as um, the virtual epileptic patient, which is a patient brain model, um, uh, which is uh, used to simulate a spread of uh, epileptogenic activity or, or seizures over the brain network. Um, this is important because um, drug-resistant epilepsy, uh, so one third of epilepsy patients um, do not respond to drugs and they have seizures. Um, and um, so the only option for these is often to uh, resect a part of the brain. So obviously we want to, we don't want to resect much part of a lot of brain. So um, uh, with this, uh, it is tried to um, confine the region of epileptic spread. Um, and this is currently uh, informing an actual clinical trial where the surgeons are really informed with the information you get from uh, this TVB model fitting. So what happens here is there's you know, the neural mass model epileptor, um, which can depend on the setting of one parameter, um, either um, generate normal, uh, healthy activity, or something that looks very much like ictal-like discharges of um, during epilepsy. So one parameter controls whether the dynamics look healthy or whether it looks like they propagate seizures or whether they even um, generate seizures. Um, uh, so um, what is done here is that with an, um, a Monte Carlo Markov chain um, sampling combined with Bayesian inference, we um, estimate the values of this parameter for each region and can also compute them um, model evidence um, under patient priors for competing hypotheses um, and uh, 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 look what most plausibly explains the, uh, the brain of the patient and how could we change it. And I think this is a good place to uh, stop. <laughs>